so i am reading each sentence our view of the ultimate reality and of the true nature of maya has compelled us to depart from these later fine excesses of the dialectical intellect and return to the original vedantic conception so a lot of things we need clarification here first of all our view but before we start just a recapitulation of what he is discussing he is discussing that the <clears throat> there is a problem with the <clears throat> at every level of consciousness you start seeing the world in a different way okay so when you are in the physical world you see the physical world as real and you see the many and you think that each of the many is independent reality that stone exists by itself that tree exists by itself the mountain exists by itself all my friends also exist by themselves i see separateness this is the first view second view your consciousness climbs you lose your identification with body mind and life and you go to the spiritual planes of consciousness i'm sorry i keep repeating but it's helpful because it becomes absolutely firmly established in the mind okay so you go to the second level of the spiritual planes of consciousness and you see the physical world is unreal there are only shadow forms and the the consciousness in which you are is the only reality so there is a second then you go even higher up and then you see the row even that second level is not the right way of looking at things the first way and the second way and you go to the third way and you see that everything has got a relative reality then you realize that the problem is not with the reality of the physical world but the problem is with your way of looking at it you are looking at it through different instruments so and he has discussed all those different theories Buddhism says the physical world is unreal. Shankara says the physical world is not unreal. It is real in time and space. It is real for a short while and then disappears. That's the nature of the physical world. But the physical world is imperfect, and if you want the divine in entire purity, you have to go up. You have to discard your body, mind, life, and go up with your consciousness, which is your true being, and you realize that the ultimate reality is. the real thing and the rest of all is relatively unreal now so we are discussing the three views in the previous paragraph now he is saying our view my view <laughs> of the ultimate reality which is ultimate reality we have already discussed this long ago it is the sat chid ananda at the highest level not at the lower level at the lower level it is there hiding itself okay so our view of the ultimate reality and of the true nature of maya what is this maya which makes you see things in a different way okay has compelled us to depart from these later fine excesses so later fine excesses he is referring to shankara's philosophy of mayavada okay that means to say that the <coughs> the way you are seeing the problem is with the way you are seeing maya and he has rekindled the advaita philosophy after 5000 years okay the buddhist um, uh, the 5000 years earlier the vedic truths okay heaven is my father and the earth is my mother absolutely everything is real and then buddhism came 600 years bc that means almost now 2500 is 2600 years it stamped its influence on the rest of india the world is unreal get away from it if you don't want suffering get rid of your the world and remain up there in the second layer of consciousness which is the spiritual planes now that is a later fine excesses it is very subtle because shankara is admitting that the physical world is real but it's an excess because it's a very fine excess It is very subtle. Okay, Shyamdas says in another place about Shankara's philosophy, very subtle and very intelligent. Okay, the physical world is not absolutely unreal. It is real in time and space, practical reality. So that's why he is saying fine excess. It's an excess because the divine is there everywhere here, but it is hiding. So he makes that. Yeah, but if you want the divine without hiding, openly, you have to go up. That's the later fine excesses of the dialectical intellect, because <clears throat> Shankara's intelligence was extremely sharp, and he has given the 
whole picture very clearly. But if you want the divine fully, you have to go up, and we depart. He is not saying we reject that. Huh? He is saying we depart from the late fine ecstasy. We make a slight distinction between the Shankaran philosophy and my philosophy. Slightly, we go away from it. We shift our focus. We deny the first theory of the unreality of the physical world, and the second uh, theory of Shankara. We depart from it. We make a slight distinction. The world is real, agreed, but the world is also evolving. So. that is what we do and we return and we return to the original vedantic conception and what is the original vedantic conception in the vedas world the supreme reality is real the earth also is real everywhere the divine is there omnipresent that's what he said or while giving every tribute to the magnificent fearlessness of these extreme conclusions to the uncompromising logical force and equity of these speculations inexpugnable so long as the premises are granted admitting the truth of the two main contentions this sole reality of the brahman and the fact that our normal conceptions about ourselves and world existence are stamped with ignorance we are ignorant because we are using wrong instruments are imperfect are misleading we are obliged to withdraw from the hold so powerfully laid by this conception of maya on the intelligence india has been dominated by the idea of maya and the unreality of the world for so long that we are forced to withdraw i am forced to withdraw from the this idea that has held so firmly in india that the world is unreal i go away from that i don't agree with that that's what he said and so but the language you have to look at the language okay so he is saying <laughs> while giving every tribute to the magnificent fearlessness of these extreme conclusions so first of all tribute he is giving high praise to shankara without mentioning him but he is talking of the later fine excesses which is the maya shankara philosophy okay to the magnificent fearlessness of these extreme conclusions why fearlessness because you are saying that the physical world with all its evil with all its cruelty with all its suffering and pain is really the divine you need to be very brave to say this you have to and that is the advaita philosophy okay so it's a magnificent fearlessness of these extreme solutions to the uncompromising logical force logical for uncompromising logical force is referring clearly to shankara and equity by the way plato also has a very similar theory and shankara includes plato also in this plato's image of the world is like that that you are in a cave man is in a cave and is looking at the back of the cave and there is a sun outside the cave and the sun is showing uh, throwing all the shadows of those people who are inside the cave at the wall of the cave and you are seeing the shadow then you are thinking it is real okay it is very similar to the uh, advaita philosophy but when you in any case whatever by discipline or by grace of god or by you turn your face away from the wall of the shadows and you turn your face towards the opening of the cave you see the sun and then you realize that the shadows are only shadows and the sun is the reality the sun is the satyananda the divine and the shadows are the world so when you turn around so it's very similar so he's talking of both plato as well as shankara and he places both of them he says the uh, <coughs> dialectical intellect and he also uses the word equity sharpness the logical sharpness of these speculations okay and he is saying we grant we grant that these premises are there but we depart from them okay we say that the physical world is we agree with that but we get one more step onwards in life divine elsewhere he has said much earlier we have read you may have forgotten he says that buddha says the world is unreal shankara says the world is not unreal but there is a even there may be a connection but there is a 
distance between the spirit and matter. But now I am saying that they are very well connected and spirit is slowly through an evolutionary descent influencing the earth. Spirit is entering into the earth and forcing it to change through a very, very long process of evolution. That is my theory. Okay, that's what he's saying. Clear? The soul reality of the Brahman and the fact that our normal conceptions about ourselves and world existence are stamped with ignorance. And what is ignorance? Using the wrong instruments of knowledge. And what are the wrong instruments? Your senses, which are defective, very clearly defective, are imperfect, are misleading. So therefore, we are obliged to withdraw from the whole so powerfully laid by this conception of Baya on the intelligence. Okay. So, what is saying? Srimdha is distancing himself from Shankara, even while praising him. Okay. Then, we go to the next sentence. But the obsession of this long-established view of things cannot be removed altogether so long as you do not fathom the true nature of the ignorance and the true and total nature of the knowledge. So, although I agree and I give high praise to Shankara, we have to know why this ignorance is like that. What is the nature of this ignorance? What is this maya? Why is this there is a clouding of the sun? Shankara's image is the sun is covered with a cloud, just like the uh, Plato's theory that you are facing the back and seeing only the shadows. So Shankara says something similar, but he uses another image. His image is the sun is covered by a cloud. And what is that cloud? Your view of things which is defective. So if somehow you manage to remove that cloud, then you have the knowledge. You see the sun and you realize the ultimate reality is the sun, that of light. Okay, so but the obsession, obsession in India for thousands of years, the world is unreal, get away from it and you will have peace and calm. We are obliged to withdraw. But the obsession of this long established view of things cannot be removed altogether so long as we do not fathom the true nature of the ignorance and the true and total nature of knowledge. Let us examine and analyze what is this Maya. For if these two are independent, equal and original powers of the consciousness, then the possibility of a cosmic illusion pursues us. What he's saying is, if spirit and matter are unconnected and they can exist by themselves, okay? that means spirit exists by itself and the earth also exists by itself independently. This is the often the theory of many, many uh, religions and Christianity also here, yeah, all the good things in the world are done by God and all the <laughs> negative things are created by the devil. Okay. So, Jahannu and um, what is the heaven? What is the word for heaven? Achanadi <laughs> in Hindi, what is the word for heaven? Jahannu is hell. Jannat. Ah, Jannat. That's right. Jannat and Jahannu. And in um, the Parsi religion you have Ormuz and Ahriman. So these theories are very common. How could God have created suffering and pain? Not possible. So these two are independent. Okay. So if you follow that policy, then you have a deep problem. You have to, the problem of the unreality of the world pursues you. Because you have started with Advaita. So, in other words, you have to throw away this, this idea that the, the two are not connected and independent realities. That's what he said. Okay. In Christianity, ah. besides you having heaven and hell, you have an in-between which is known as purgatory. Again, my phone rang and disturbed me. In Christianity, you have, what did you say? Besides you heaven, heaven and hell. Okay. But in between the two, you have an intermediate state known as purgatory. Achha, okay, okay. So yeah, there are so many theories, but Srimad is saying that if you see no connection between the two, the problem exists still. So, I have one more. I have one more question. Go ahead. The Aurobindo always calls the good spirit as Ormas, O R. 
S U Z. But yeah. in the Parsi, it is not O. It is H. Hormuz. Acha, acha. Okay. Which is which is more correct? Okay. So I don't know from where you got that. O R M U S R is the name, but D Z. Yeah. Yeah. Hormuz. It is O instead of H. Acha, acha. So yeah. That's who right. is more correct? I presume Sri Aurobindo would be more correct. <laughs> I think it's a question of pronunciation, na? <laughs> one one would be O Ormuz. Yeah. And according to the Parsis, it's H Ormuz. Acha acha. Okay. Because in Bengali also we have the same problem. In Sanskrit it is A uh, and A, uh, and in Bengali you have O. The same thing is pronounced in a different way. <laughs> no, <laughs> but. Uh, wouldn't uh, Sri Aurobindo be more correct because all our Parsi scriptures were destroyed and burnt by the Muslims when they invaded Iran? Ah, so ah. would the O be more correct than the H? Ah, that's something I can't say. <laughs> he has to say. <laughs> so anyway, it's interesting. So, <laughs> yeah. There are small differences like that. Yeah. See, uh, these differences exist everywhere. Na? You have, for instance, in the, uh, the name Yusuf, okay, is um, Islamic. And Joseph, the same name pronounced in a different way, is a Christian, okay, or the Jewish, Joseph and Yusuf. Like that, there are Abraham and Ibrahim. So, it's a question of pronunciation, but the word is the same at root. So, this is difficult to say who is right and who is wrong. I don't know. I can't say. Anyway, it was an interesting discussion because precisely small differences of pronunciation always come up. But the root is the same. So, okay. So, we go back. So, he's saying, if if these two, that means spirit and matter, are equal and original powers of God, that means they exist independently, then the possibility of a cosmic illusion pursues us. We are not being able to solve the problem. So, we say that they are not independent realities, but they are connected realities. That's what his conclusion is. So, if ignorance is the very character of cosmic existence, then our experience of the universe, if not the experience itself, becomes illusory. The physical world may not be unreal, but your way of looking at it is unreal if ignorance is the main character of the physical world. In other words, when you are in this room, you are using broken spectacles. When you go up, your spectacles become clear and without any cracks then you are seeing the oneness of things. That's what he's saying, okay? If not, the universe becomes illusory. So, or if ignorance is not the very grain of our natural being, but still an original and eternal power of consciousness, then while there can be a truth of cosmos, it may be impossible for a being in the universe while he is in it to know its truth. So, he's saying there are two things. Essentially, when you are in the physical world, whether you are an animal or a man or whatever, but the uni when you are in the universe, the universe will always give you only broken specs. That's what he's saying. But is it possible that even when you are in the physical world, your spectacles will be clear and full? That's what he's asking. Okay, that also is a possibility. In fact, that possibility is what Sam is examining. Na? He says that even when you are in the physical world, you can have the Knowledge of the divine presence. So, the specs are not necessarily and inevitably broken in the physical world. And for you have to climb up to get the clear spectacles. That's what he's saying. But it is not necessary. He will tell you later on that even in the physical world, you can throw away your cracked <laughs> glasses and get the proper glasses. It's possible to experience the divine even in the physical world. Don't use the wrong instrument. Don't use only senses. Use subtle senses. Use other instruments. Okay? Intuition, identity, light. Use light. Don't be deceived by the shadow. 
gives light. That's what he said. So <laughs> there are two possibilities he's examining here. If ignorance is the very character of cosmic existence, then our experience of the universe, if not the universe itself, becomes illusory. In other words, what he's saying is, if the world will always offer you only broken specs, then you have a problem. The ignorance at the lower level is permanent. But if ignorance is not the very grain of our natural being, okay, it's not the very nature. It is something imposed upon you and offered to you, which you can discard. But still, an original and eternal power of consciousness, then, while there can be a truth of cosmos, it may be impossible for a being in the universe, while he is in it, to know its truth. He can only arrive at real knowledge by passing beyond mind and thought, beyond this world formation, and viewing all things from above in some supracosmic or supercosmic consciousness. Okay, like those who have become one of one nature with the eternal and dwell in him, unborn. Just one minute, my computer has jumped. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So <clears throat> he's saying, uh, Buddha, Buddha is saying that you have to go up. Shankara is saying that yes, you have to go up for the, but even the divine uh, is there in the physical world, but hiding. Okay. So if you want him without hiding, go up. Shankara is saying, now he will tell you his own theory. Okay. So he's saying, <clears throat> and that also there are two theories. Going up, how far? Okay. Some supra-cosmic or super-cosmic. Now, what is meant by that? Supra-cosmic at the highest level of the cosmos, which means the, uh, in terms of language, it would mean the overmind consciousness. But super-cosmic outside the cosmos. Okay. So, you see, the dividing line, if you are below the dividing line, you are in the overmind consciousness. And that is supra-cosmic. But if you are above the dividing line, super cosmic, outside the universe, that's the super mind, okay? Consciousness like those who have become of one nature with the eternal and dwell in him. Okay? Permanently you have that consciousness. Unborn in the creation and unafflicted by the cataclysmic destruction of the worlds below them. So cataclysmic destruction, there's a, um, there's a footnote. Let's read the footnote. Oh, he referred to the Gita. So, destruction. So, let me see what I have marked cataclysmic. Yeah, is a meaning. A sudden violent change in the Earth's surface. This cataclysmic destruction of the world below. So, if you are up there, you will see that the world is not as real as you think it to be. That's what he said. Okay. So. So, but the solution of this problem, now he's going to give you his own solution, cannot be satisfactorily pursued and reached on the basis of an examination of words and ideas or a dialectical discussion. You must have experience, that's what he's saying. It must be the result of a total observation and penetration of the relevant facts of consciousness. We have to examine consciousness. We have to examine the process of what instruments you are using and why you are using wrong instruments, that's what he's saying. That we have to go to the origin of ignorance. And ignorance is defined as using the wrong instruments for seeing the reality of the physical world. Both those of the surface and below or above our surface level or behind our frontal surface and a successful fathoming of their significance. And how do you examine the, analyze the um, uh, consciousness? He's saying, you have to see those of the surface, the consciousness of the surface, your body, mind, life. Then you have to go below. You have to see the subconscious and the inconscient. And above, our surface level, the above is the superconscious. And behind our frontal, that's the intraconscious. So you have to see consciousness in all, above, at the surface, below the surface, and inside. If you see all that, then you will understand the problem will be solved. That's what he said. Okay? So we have 
Uh, more than 20 minutes, we can read the, no, not 20 minutes, uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> so we have got definitely enough time. So we can read the next paragraph for the dialectical intellect. So, Yasmin, if uh, Archanadi, if you are okay, because you sometimes have to leave early, can you read if you have the text <laughs> for the dialectical intellect? No, Rangata, I will not be able to read. I, to can leave. I read? Can I read? Yes, yes. 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 Yeah, Yasmin will read and later on something. So we can read. Yeah. Yasmin, go ahead. For the dialectical intellect. For, for the dialectical intellect is not a sufficient judge of essential or spiritual truths. Moreover, very often by its propensity to deal with words and abstract ideas as if they were binding realities, it wears them as chains and does not look really beyond them to the essential and total facts of our existence. Intellectual statement is an account of our intelligence and a justification by reasoning of a seeing of things which pre-exist in our tone of mind or temperament or in some tendency of our nature and secretly predetermines the very reasoning that claims to lead to it. That reasoning itself can be a conclusive only if the perception of things on which it rests is both a true and a whole scene. Here what we have to see truly and integrally is the nature and validity of our consciousness, the origin and scope of our mentality. For then alone we know the truth of our being and nature and of the world being and world nature. Our principle in such an inquiry must be to see and know. The dialectical intellect is to be used only so far as it helps to clarify our arrangement and justify expression of the vision and the knowledge. But it cannot be allowed to govern our conceptions and exclude truth that does not fall within the rigid frame of its logic. Illusion, knowledge and ignorance are terms or results of our consciousness. And it is only by looking deeply into our consciousness that we can discover and determine the character and relations of the knowledge and ignorance or of the illusion, if it exists, and the reality. Being is, is no doubt the fundamental object of inquiry. Things in themselves and things in their nature <clears throat> but it is only through consciousness that we can approach being. Or if it is, or if it be maintained that we can only reach being, enter into the real, because it is superconscious, though extinction or transcendence of consciousness, or through its self transcendence and self transformation. It is still through consciousness that we must arrive at knowledge of this necessity and the process or power of execution of this extinction or this self-transcendence, this transformation. Then, through consciousness, through consciousness, to know of the superconscious truth become the supreme need and to discover the power and process of consciousness by which it can pass into superconscious, the supreme discovery. Okay, so I'll just uh, do one thing. I'll read out the summary and then we'll go into details. Okay, so the <clears throat> mind of man, he is discussing the mind of man. He is discussing the, <clears throat> the <clears throat> how we come to know. We use our mind, which is an instrument of knowledge. It's not an instrument of knowledge, it's an instrument of ignorance. So you come to know something of the truth of things, but only half, not full. That's what he said. I'm reading out the summary, which is not his words, but my words. But we get the basic idea of what he's saying. The mind of man, which he calls the dialectical intellect. Okay, the word dialectical is 
you examine one side of the truth, then you examine the opposite side of the truth, and then you come to a conclusion. That's a dialectical method. The mind of man, the dialectical intellect, cannot know the essential and spiritual truth. In other words, mind of man is necessarily ignorant. It cannot reach the higher level. Just as the animal is limited to the sense knowledge, mind, man also is limited to the mind knowledge. The yogi is limited. Again, he is also limited by his spiritual knowledge. So only at the highest supramental knowledge is the full truth revealed to you. So that's what he's saying. The mind of man cannot know the essential and spiritual truth. Mind often gets chained to use words it uses and cannot disengage itself from the suggestions and implications of words. When you use the word maya, you get stuck with the idea of illusion. That's what he's saying. Intellectual statements often start from pre-existent notions that color the reasoning that seemingly leads to new conclusions. Logic is something you have to always start from a premise. A logic is you always start from a premise. Okay, So logic is that's the first defect. You have to first assume something and then find out whether it is true or false. So that's the whole problem. Pre-existent. In other words, a hypothesis or a premise, okay, which is not proved. You take it like that. So he's saying intellectual statements often start from a pre-existent notion that color the reasoning that seemingly leads to new conclusions. We have therefore to examine our consciousness and discover its nature and validity. The problem of the unreality of the world will be solved when you examine very clearly the instruments of knowledge, the consciousness. What are the consciousness at different levels? And discover its nature and validity. The principle of knowledge is to see and know. So what's he saying? Don't depend on thought. Depend on experience. That's what he's saying. Depend on experience very clearly to see and know. Okay. And that is exactly what also the science is doing. Experiment and find out. Okay. Find out the truth. The principle of knowledge is to see and know. Intellect and logic have their valid functions, but they cannot be allowed to hijack the truth and exclude other truths not palatable to it. Okay. Something you don't find. Um, convincing, then you reject it. You don't get to reject it. That's what they say. Illusion, knowledge and ignorance are modes and functions of consciousness and only looking honestly into consciousness can our conceptions of knowledge, ignorance and illusion have validity. Go to the source and ex experience what consciousness is. Don't go by thought and suppositions. That's what he saying. Being, which is existence, that means the reality of the truth. You cannot. So this being, being and ex existence are words which you have to make very clear to yourself by saying that it is a subtle substance. Then it becomes clear. Okay, the subtle substance is the reality. So being, existence, and subtle substance, all same, is no doubt the object of all knowledge and inquiry. But being can be approached only through consciousness. The substance, you can know the substance only through consciousness. Or again, if there is insistence that the being, the real, the existence can be approached only by annulling consciousness, even then it's only through consciousness that we arrive at that knowledge. So what he's saying is, there is a substance. Okay? Suppose you are a, a carpenter. How will you know what you are going to produce unless you know the nature of the wood? Okay. See, <clears throat> some woods are hard, you can use for certain things. Some woods are soft, you can use for certain things. Some woods you cannot use at all because they are very brittle. So, this is what he's saying. The substance is there, the wood is there, and you have to see the nature of this wood. That's what he's saying. And you can know the nature of the wood only through consciousness. So, <clears throat> You have to use your consciousness to see the substance. 
the existence can be approached only by annulling consciousness. Even then, it's only through consciousness that we can arrive at that knowledge. Thus, it is only through consciousness that we can arrive at the superconscious truth. Consciousness is the fundamental factor. So you have to examine the truth of consciousness. This is the summary. And we have still eight minutes. So we'll start looking at the, the para and the sentences. Okay. <laughs> For the dialectical intellect. No. Is that what we have to read or the next one? Just one second. No, for the dialectical intellect is what we have to read. Right, okay, that's what I get sometimes confused because my entire text is not there. Only one para is there at a time. Okay, so for the dialectical intellect, what do you mean by that? The normal activity of the mind for normal man, when he is in the physical world, the mortal mind, if you want, okay, the mind with its intelligence, that's all. The very intelligent or is the dialectical intellect is a word for the mind. You can use the word mortal mind. That will disappear. It's a construction of nature. But the dialectical intellect is not a sufficient judge of essential or spiritual truths. By the, by the mind, you cannot know the truth. That's its nature. That's the thing. It's a limitation, fundamental limitation. Moreover, very often, by its propensity to deal with words and abstract ideas as if they were binding realities, it wears them as chains and does not look freely beyond them to the essential and total facts of our existence. Now, this is very interesting, and that's exactly what we try to do in those texts. We try to look beyond the words and see what's in their meaning. Okay? But still, it's a Mental exercise, but you have to do this in a spiritual way. You have to go beyond the words and look at the what they represent. We have to know the essence of what that word is. Okay? All words are only representations of something. If I have a lion, I can use the word lion. I can use the uh, word simham, simham, okay, and uh, I can use different words in different languages. But they all represent the essence of one thing, which is the lion itself. So you have to go to the lion and not stuck, get stuck with the words. So when you say Maya, then you have to go to what Maya really is in the essence. That's what Sandy is saying. Don't use your mind, which is only engaging with words. They are only chains, Sandy is saying. Intellectual statement is an account to our intelligence and a justification by reasoning of a seeing of things, okay, which pre-exists in our turn of mind and temperament in some tendency of our nature, secretly predetermines the very reasoning that claims to it. In other words, he's saying that the mind is always open to predilection and preconceived ideas. However much you try to be objective, you really cannot be objective because that's not the nature of the mind. The nature of the objectivity, true objectivity comes only when you get out of your body, your life and your mind. You are not using your mind anymore. It's an instrument which is defective. They use a better instrument, go to the higher mind, okay, which is the, <coughs> it's a much truer way of seeing than the mental man, mental, uh, uh, the mortal man, mortal, sorry, no, mortal mind, okay. That's what he's saying. It's a better instrument. Secretly, I mean, the very reasoning that claims to lead to it. In other words, you are bound to have preconceived ideas. This is what everybody does. Na? Also, if you look at very carefully, everybody, they have got a certain fixed ideas. And when a new idea comes, you try to fit that new idea into your already existing ideas. It's like trying to fix a, a square peg in a round hole. And if you can't fit it, then you say, oh, I don't understand. And if you manage to fit it somehow, you say, oh, I understand. So you are trying to understand new ideas and trying to fit them into pre-existent ideas. 
that's what basically Shetra is saying. So, that reasoning, the reasoning of the mind, the process of thinking, itself can be conclusive only if the perception of things on which it rests is whole, a true and a whole seeing. Our mind, does it see wholly and truly? No. It sees only parts. That's what he's saying. Here, what we have to see truly and integrally is the nature and validity of our consciousness, the origin and scope of our mentality. He's repeating what he said earlier, that we have to examine consciousness, see from where it is coming, what is its nature. For then alone can we know the truth of our being and nature. Truth of our being at the higher level and nature at the outer level, body, mind, life. And of world being and world nature. So, our principle in such an inquiry must be to see and know. Okay? Experiment. Don't go by preconceived ideas. This is also what science also says. I will believe only when I have experimented and seen the nature of things. It's a good thing. And they are also realizing that the mind and the senses are not giving you the full picture. Okay? Our, princi our principle, Sam those principles, in such an inquiry must be to see and know. By the way, the word inquiry, you can write it with an I-N or you can also write it with an E-N. Okay? Both are allowed. Must be to see and know. The dialectical intellect is to be used only so far as it helps to clarify our arrangement and justify our expression of the vision and the knowledge. But it cannot be allowed to govern our conceptions and exclude truth that does not fall within the rigid frame of its logic. So, as I said, <coughs> new ideas, you can think of them as um, square peg and the rigid frame of the logic is the round and you are trying to fit and when it doesn't fit, you reject it. You have, because your rigid frame of logic is limited. So you should rather not use a rigid frame and not reject the truth. Okay, that's it. Illusion, knowledge and ignorance are terms or results of our consciousness and it is only by looking deeply into our consciousness that we can discover and determine the character and relations of the knowledge and the ignorance or the illusion if it exists. Is it real? Is it is illusion a reality? That's what we have to see. And the reality. Being is no doubt the fundamental object of inquiry. Things in themselves and things in their nature. So, things in themselves and things in their nature. So, to everything, there's an essentiality and there's an outer form. Okay? Just like saltiness is the essentiality and the grain of salt is the outer form. Okay? That's what he's saying. Okay? So, he's saying things in themselves, the saltiness, and things in their nature, the outer form. Okay? We have to go beyond what he's saying and when you give an image to yourself, it becomes clear. Rangana, is, in, it, uh, is it what is called Nama Rupa? What? What did you say? Is this essentiality and form the same as Nama Rupa? Exactly, exactly. Essentiality is things in themselves. Exactly. That's it. And things in their nature. But it is only through consciousness that we can approach being. We have to use consciousness to understand being. And being, as I told you, you can think of it as existence or you make it more concrete to yourself, you can think of it as subtle matter. Okay? <clears throat> or if it be maintained, that we can only reach being, enter into the real, because it is superconscious, through extinction or transcendence of consciousness or through its self-transcendence and self-transformation. It is still through consciousness that you must arrive at the knowledge of this necessity and the process or power of execution of this extinction or this self-transcendence this transformation. Now, it is a very complicated sentence, but we'll try and understand what he's saying and what he's referring to. Or if it be maintained that we can reach, reach being. Okay? In fact, in spiritual experience, sometimes you experience only the sat aspect. You experience only the substance, but not consciousness and force and ananda. Okay? So that's what he's saying. 
if you reach only the sat aspect, enter into the real, that substance is absolutely real. <laughs> because it is super conscious, through extinction or transcendence of consciousness. The, here again, there are two possibilities in spiritual experience. One is extinction of consciousness, okay, like the Buddhist thing, okay, the world is blown out of existence, or you go beyond it. Consciousness exists at a lower level, but you are going beyond it. Okay? So, <clears throat> again, I'll just briefly mention what he's saying through extinction, okay, or transcendence of consciousness. So, one is extinction means you experience the infinite, and who is experiencing the infinite? There is someone who is experiencing the infinite. So you are conscious of yourself and you are experiencing the infinite. But there is another experience where the experiencer disappears and you become the existent. Okay? In spiritual experience, both these things are possible. You can know that you are the cosmic being and there is another experience in which the you disappears altogether. You become the cosmos. You become the infinite. Okay, so that's what he meaning here. <coughs> that we arrive at extinction or self transcendence. This transformation. Then, through consciousness, to know of the super conscious truth becomes the supreme need, and to discover the power and process of consciousness. Power and process, Maya. How is consciousness operating? The power and process by which it can pass into superconscious, the supreme discovery. So you have to examine consciousness and see whether consciousness itself can pass into superconsciousness. Okay, that's what it's saying. So we have gone nearly five minutes beyond our time. So we'll stop here anyway. But in ourselves, consciousness seems to be identical with mind. So we'll take that up next time, next week on Wednesday. Okay. So, Guru Aar, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Rangada. Okay, okay. Next time, it's okay, you will read. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Have a nice day.